Good morning, Mr. Rabinovitz. Uh, <coughs> my lady, in the course of yesterday, I mentioned a page from the Barrage Restatement which was um, missing and might be useful on the unjust factors. Uh, and I also referred the court to uh, Lord Hope and Clyde Lord Benson, and I said I would get you copies. Um, we have um, got copies. Uh, of a filleted uh, version, yes. <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> nice and short. Um, we've also tabbed, um, by which I mean put a blue sticker on the relevant pages. Thank you. Uh, but perhaps I can just um, identify um, once they're given to you, um, um, if we have in mind. Um, you'll recall that the, the, the Burrage Restatement, um, they're all tabbed and, you, and, and it'll be clear where they ought to go. Uh, the Burrows page goes at the beginning of Volume 2, tab 15. <coughs> They go, uh, volume 2, tab 15. And whilst the court is putting that in, um, just to um, identify a point which we're relying on here, uh, it's really paragraph 3, when is the enrichment unjust? And then you have a listing out yeah. of the unjust factors. Uh, and then um, <coughs> on the following page, page 31, paragraphs 3, 2 to 3, 5, um, <coughs> Uh, again, there's an there's a explanation of what is meant by the unjust factor. It says it's in an elegant term, <coughs> but, but it's pretty clear in how it's used. And that is also, there is a reference back to what you were saying yesterday about um, the analogy being drawn with tort rather than contract. Precisely. And there being categories, and these are the categories. Precisely, and, and, they're, and they're not fixed and frozen. They will expand, but they expand in the same way as tort categories Incremental. Incremental, um, by reference to exactly decided cases, uh, and, and never radically, or very seldom radically, if I can put it that way, because that wouldn't be incremental. Um, <clears throat> but so, so, so we are working by reference to fixed rules and fixed categories. Um, the the second um, extract that that um, we've handed up it goes to tab nineteen again in volume two, uh, and as it, it is, as I say, the the bits from Lord Hope's judgment in Clymore Benson. Uh, and what we have is the head note, uh, and then we jump to uh, Lord uh, Hope. Um, and just so that I can identify for the court where the relevant passages are, I've provided this just so that you see the context in which uh, he was dealing with this. It was obviously a mistake of law case. It was a case which said there was a claim for mistake of law and not a limitation problem. If I can invite the court to go to page 407, the court sees the heading at the bottom of the page, was there a mistake? Uh, and Lord Hope poses the question, subject to any defences that may arise from the circumstances, a claim for restitution of money paid under this mistake raises three questions. One, was there a mistake? Two, did the mistake cause the payment? And three, did the payee have a right to receive the sum which was paid to him? That's the third question which is relevant. Um, and then if one goes over the page, uh, 408 at B, the third question arises because the payee cannot be said to have been unjustly enriched if he was entitled to receive the sum paid to him. And whilst uh, we have this um, open, if I can invite the court just to look at page 409 at B, you see there again the reference to the unjust factor approach. First sentence, uh, the approach of the common law is to look for an unjust factor and a reference to that. <coughs> and if one goes back to 408B, um, 
it, it goes on, the pair may have been mistaken as to the grounds on which the son was due to the payee, but his mistake will not provide a ground for its recovery. Uh, you would say, in this case, there was no mistake. There was no mistake. Uh, and I accept, um, I accept that a different unjust factor could be failure of basis. Mm. But, but, but I've made my submissions, and I'm going to be repeating some of them, about the failure of basis category, uh, and whether um, it can ever be said that, um, uh, that you can identify a failure of basis which is contradicted by the express terms of the contract, identifying the basis for a particular payment. Uh, and, and this may be, I'm going to come back to it, but there are two, t two types of case in which you could have failure of basis. Uh, and there are Roxburgh and um, um, Barnes. Barnes. Mm -hmm. In the one type of case, you have a failure basis in relation to a payment or part of a payment. In another type of case, and, and that's the Roxburgh type, and that's our case. <laughs> that has to be our case as well. Um, in another type of case, which is the Barnes case, you have a failure of, of the whole basis of the contract or the whole basis of some serious part, material part of the contract such as in Barnes, where you don't have a, a, a payment at all. You know, Barnes is not a case in which a payment was made. The failure of basis argument was made by reference to of the contract as a whole, uh, and it was said that the contract and its terms were made on a basis where both parties proceeded on an assumption uh, that there would be a lien from which the receiver could recover his remuneration. Again, that, that is very different to our sort of case. <coughs> um, at the end of um, uh, yesterday, I was uh, I'd made my I'd taken the court to Roxburgh, uh, and I'd made the point I think probably more than once about academic commentary. Um, um, <coughs> we have identified um, the at least some of the more um, central academic commentary at paragraph 24 and 25 of our skeleton. Um, and can I invite the court to go to that, just for references. I need to take you very quickly, if I may, to the relevant parts of the, the academic commentary, which yes, is what I, 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 I did do. you a disservice. I looked blank yesterday, or sounded blank, um, about the references in your skeleton. They are all there. They so are I apologize for that. But, but at the very least, I can identify where in the bundles they are, if that helps, uh, and very quickly um, show you uh, what we have in mind. Um, so, um, if you are at um, our skeleton, page 92, uh, at 24.1 we refer to Peter Burke's uh, failure of consideration is placed on its map, and, and that's a 2002 article, and the court will have in mind that Roxburgh was a 2001 article. I ought just to say this, and I'm sorry again to be jumping Sorry, 2001 out. case. 2001 mm. case. Yeah. So, all of these are in the immediate aftermath. Um, I think I've said um, that it was controversial, and I've said that some commentators um, consider it to be wrongly decided, uh, and they're all commentators which are pre-Barnes. <coughs> when we get to Barnes, the court will see at paragraph 114, uh, and indeed in other parts of Barnes, uh, that Lord Tulson refers to Roxburgh and, and, and certainly doesn't say he thinks it's wrong. Mm. Uh, and there's certain aspects where he plainly <coughs> says it's right. For example, you're not limited to looking at promissory, what the, the, the promise consideration. It doesn't uh, directly address uh, whether uh, Roxburgh itself, in terms of the decision, was right. But at paragraph 114, which we'll, I'll come to, he does make the point that Roxburgh is an example of a partial failure of consideration case. Uh, and again, he, he says that without any disapproval. So I don't want the court to be left with the impression um, that it hasn't been judicially considered and that um, it's been uh, not been, at the very least, I think Bologna Crane could say, it, it certainly hasn't been um, disfavoured. So um, can I just very quickly show you the Burke's article? You have that at volume two of the authorities, tab 12. It begins at um, page... Five, five, seven. 
you see from, sorry, if you go back to 554, you'll see it's the Burke's article, Failure Consideration, and you'll see it's a 2002 article, uh, and it is all about um, Roxburgh. At least it starts by referring to Roxburgh, which, which Professor Burke says is a fascinating case. <laughs> Um, uh, the like slip round that obstacle without successfully explaining how they get past it. <laughs> exactly, and, and that is that, that is um, really the theme um, uh, of uh, the extract that I'm going to take you to. And he's not the only one. A lot of the academics say when they look at the Roxburgh reasoning of the majority, this will not do, um, <laughs> because they they do not think that the majority really confronted what was an issue. If I can invite the court to go to page five five seven. Um, the valid contract. This is a the really difficult point. The orthodox doctrine is that an enrichment transferred under a valid contract cannot be recovered unless the contract is rescinded or terminated. In this case, the parties made a valid contract of sale. The contract had indeed been discharged, but only on quite poor performance. Justice Kirby dissenting sees this difficulty, but is either unable or unwilling to overcome it. Uh, for him, the validity of the sale under which the full price, including the tax, was paid, constitutes an absolute bar to the retailer's claim. The majority judgments appear to take the line that this element of orthodox doctrine is indistinguishable from the old rule that there can be can no recovery for failure of consideration unless the consideration failed totally. The requirement of total failure has been very much weakened. Severance and apportionment are now more widely acceptable. The majority judgments appear to assume that by adopting and adhering to that relatively new position, they escape the orthodoxy which bars restitution of benefits transferred under a valid contract. This will not quite do. Uh, a mistake which would otherwise indisputably require restitution will be ineffectual if the value in question passed under a contract. <coughs> and um, let me just re refer to that. The claimant will then succeed only if he, can sh he or she can show that the mistake destroyed the contract itself by parity of reasoning in the very rare case that a failure of consideration can be made out despite the validity and indeed the performance of the contract. The contract <coughs> remains an obstacle to the claim of rest to restitution. Uh, the rationale behind the bar can be expressed in the proposition that contracts must not be subverted or that irreconcilable contradictions between the law of contract and the law of restitution cannot be tolerated. And again, we obviously rely on that. Orthodoxies are sometimes stated too widely. This one has been much discussed. This is Professor Beetson's first shot at it. Professor Beetson had argued, rightly, that a more sophisticated analysis would conclude that the bar is not absolute. In particular, he says that a distinction should be drawn between cases in which restitution would disturb legitimate hopes and fears inherent in the bargain and others where it would not. In the latter, the orthodox rule should give way. <coughs> and and um, going on, that seems to be exactly the right way to approach this case. The crucial fact is that neither the payment of the tax nor the amount of that payment were, views, were viewed as negotiable. There were no hopes and fears in that regard, no tax, no payment. As between the parties, there is no doubt whatever that restitution of the tax returned to them return them to exactly the position they would have been in if, to their knowledge, the tax had been annulled or repealed before the payment. That's all I was going to show uh, the court on that. Um, if I could then, um, going back to our skeleton, the next article is another Burke's article in his text on unjust enrichment. We have that at tab 13, which is the next tab, beginning at 567. Court may just want to write on the top of this because it's not obvious. This is Burke's unjust enrichment. Um, That's apparent at the bottom. Ah, good. Thank you. It's an article. Edition. So this is a 2005 uh, work. Um, and as we say there, he endorses Professor Beetson's as his then was view. I could also say as his view then was, um, because that, as I say, has changed. Uh, that it was right to treat in isolation an invalid, invalid element of the contract which was non negotiable as to which the parties therefore seem no risk. One sees this if you go to 571. Uh, and again, just picking up in the middle of the page, uh, more recently, against the determined dissent by Justice Kirby on the very ground that the law does not allow uh, awards of restitution within a valid contract, the High Court of Australia has again come firmly down on the side of the apparently unorthodox cases. In Roxburgh and Rothmans, the appellant and then you have the facts. Uh, then dropping down to the next paragraph, cases of this complexion seem to say that even within a perfectly valid contract, there can be a partial failure of basis. That cannot be. Uh, what they stand for is that in a rare case, there can be a failure of a particular obligation within a valid contract. There is a total failure of basis. When the obligation goes, the base of the enrichment, which it purported to explain, fails totally. Professor Beetson as we then was, argued that the real question was whether restitution would upset the contractual distribution risks. Uh, exceptionally, he said it's right to treat in isolation an invalid element within a contract which was non-negotiable. 
uh, as to which the parties therefore took no risk. That seems right, but it needs some reinforcement to show why it does not derogate from the necessity of total failure of basis. If an item is genuinely non-negotiable, the payment of any excess is as much a payment of a non-existent debt as when the contract itself is misapplied so as to cause an overpayment. Provided that the excess is cleanly identifiable and independent of the other obligations of the contract, the basis for that payment totally fails because the money is paid to discharge an obligation and the obligation does not exist. Many cases will need to be reconsidered. Beaton himself has said that his approach would not reach Roxburgh and Rothman. And that's uh, a reference to the Virgo article. Perhaps I can just show uh, the court uh, that. Uh, you have that at tab 10 of the same authorities bundle. So tab 10 at page 5 to, beginning at page 5 to so, 2. So this is the change of position? This is the uh, change of position by so Professor. In a, in a very short space of time. Indeed, and it may be that he was persuaded by Virgo, mm. because this is written with Virgo, and one can imagine in one's head the two of them sitting down and saying, well, does this actually work? Um, mm -hmm. 522, uh, uh, if you go to 523, <coughs> bottom of the page, <coughs> failure of consideration. In many cases where a claimant has paid tax which is not due, the restitutionary claim lies against the revenue authority which has received the payment, so the ground of restitution would be, rec would be that recognised by the House of Lords of Woolwich, namely ultra vires. This ground of restitution was not available in Roxburgh because the licence fee had not been paid over to the revenue authority but remained with the wholesaler. This was therefore simply a private law restitutionary claim. However, the High Court concluded, Justice Kirby dissenting, that the relevant ground for ordering restitution of the payment was failure of consideration. The validity of this conclusion is doubtful. Uh, the doubtfulness stems from the fact uh, that a fundamental principle relating to the application of the ground of total failure of consideration, in particular, and unjust enrichment generally, is that the law of restitution is subordinate to the law of contract. It follows that restitutionary remedies are generally only available in a contractual context once the contract has been set aside, for example, for breach frustration because it is unenforceable. Okay, notion. So, this, so was this requirement satisfied in Roxburgh? Although the majority recognised that the purchase price of the cigarettes incorporated the wholesale of the cost of the cigarettes uh, and a distinct sum as payment for the licence fee, this sum was paid pursuant to a contract which remained valid despite the invalidity of the statute which, was, which it was thought required the payment of a licence fee. So again, to miss the bit in brackets. Alternatively, it might be argued that the failure of the respondents to pay the licence fee to the revenue authority was a breach of contract, but it seems that the respondents did not promise to do this there was no breach. It appears, therefore, that the contract had not been terminated which is for this reason that Justice Kirby concluded that the ground of failure consideration could not be established. And this was one reason why he dissented as regards the majority or bar one failed to consider the requirement that the contract must have been terminated before restitutionary relief can be awarded. Uh, Justice Kellner did consider this matter. He suggested that restitution would be available as long as performance was not possible and the formal termination of the contract was required and bringing proceedings for restitution would be sufficient. This, in effect, means that restitution is no longer subordinate to contract, and surely this will involve the unnecessary and unprincipled usurpation of the law of contract by the law of restitution. On a theoretical level, one of us has argued, <laughs> it's very nice that they don't identify which one, one of us has argued uh, that there may be exceptional circumstances where a re re restitution relief can be awarded, uh, even though uh, the contract has not been terminated, but only where this would not subvert the contractual allocation of risk, and then they do identify which one. Theoretically, uh, but this was, there was no evidence in Roxburgh that the risk of the license fee being invalid had been placed on the wholesaler rather than the retailers. Surely the burden of proving that the allocation of risk had not been undermined should be placed on the retailers who sought restitution. It will only be the most exceptional case where this burden could be discharged. It may be that the majority's failure to address the issues stems from the view of the foundation of the claim as equitable, uh, and in Justice Gummer's case, uh, based on unconscionability. And again, there appears to be a slight divergence between the way in which the Australian cases view restitution. I think that's the way it used to be. I think it's reverted somewhat to a much tighter. Um, the fact that the license fee had been paid pursuant to a valid and enforceable contract also defeated any argument that the fee could be recovered on the ground of mistake of law. This was recognised by Justice Kirby, but not mentioned by any of the other judges. If the contract remains valid, it is not for the law of restitution to intrude and say there has been an operative mistake which would justify restitution. I'm not sure um, who was reading here. So I, I ought to read the, 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 the majority did provide some useful insights, uh, two paragraphs down, into the nature of the uh, ground of total failure of consideration. Justice Gummo defined the notion of consideration broadly as the failure to sustain itself of the state of affairs contemplated as the basis for the payments the appellant seeks to recover. 
This focus on failure of basis rather than failure of promise is important and accords with the Burke's notion of consideration. It was especially relevant in Roxburgh because the wholesaler did not specifically promise that it would pass the license fee element on to the revenue authorities, but this was the expectation of the appellant. Or the failure total, although the retailers had received the consideration for which they bargained, the majority were still able to conclude that there had been a total failure of consideration by means of apportioning the consideration between that relating to the cigarettes and that relating to the payment of the license fee. As regards to the latter element, the consideration failed totally because there was no liability to discharge. Justice Gummo also recognised in the alternative that the requirement that consideration must fail totally does not apply where two conditions are satisfied. These are that there is no contractual remedy, since otherwise a recognition of partial failure of consideration would undermine the compensatory remedy for breach of contract, and there are no difficulties in apportioning this consideration. Since both these requirements are satisfied in this case, he was willing to accept that restitution on the ground of partial failure of consideration was appropriate. Uh, and then conclusion. Uh, the shift in emphasis from unjust enrichment analysis to analysis in terms of equitable foundations generally and unconscionability in particular may be a natural development in Australian jurisprudence, but it should be firmly rejected in England. Roxburgh illustrates the dangers in such a shift away from recognised principles. It is submitted that the concern with the recognition of the unjust principle, unjust enrichment principle, means that the majority fail to address the fact that this principle must generally be subordinate to the law of contract. In doing so, the result of the decision of the High Court is likely to be the cause of greater confusion and uncertainty by undermining the contractual regime. So that's um, um, Bates and Virgo. And, and while we're on the uh, academics who um, think uh, the decision was wrong, um, can I just show you Goff and Jones, a very short extra extract, tab 17 of the same body. And I'm sorry to be taking so much time on this, but it, but it is, um, uh, as I say, controversial and, and not straightforward. So tab 17 for Goff and Jones, page 621. And thankfully, this is a shorter article. It's picking up at paragraph 326. Um, uh, the decision of the High Court in Roxburgh and Rothmans and Palmol has directly challenged the orthodoxy that no claim in unjust enrichment can arise in respect of a contract discharged by performance. Uh, and then we have the facts. Uh, and then dropping to five lines <coughs> from the end. The decision has divided English commentators with the point of dispute being whether the remedy in unjust enrichment undermines the contractual allocation of risk. Those who have criticised the decision argue that the contract allocated the risk of the tax becoming unconstitutional to the retailer because it made no provision for payment to be returned. On the other hand, it has been argued uh, that because the amount paid for the tax was fixed from the outset and was not the product of any negotiation between the parties, it was no subversion of the contract to allow that, that sum to be recovered in unjust enrichment. On balance, the former view is more convincing. Whilst it is quite true that the parties had not negotiated about the sum payable in respect of the license fee, and the unjust enrichment remedy coincided with the value that the parties had agreed, the fact remains that by requiring its repayment in the absence of any contractual term, the court reallocated the risk to the wholesaler. And then <coughs> Professor Burrows, um, we refer to that paragraph 24.3 of our skeleton. You will find that at tab 16 uh, um, of the bundle beginning at 614. And this is uh, his law of restitution text rather than the restatement. And at 616, well, you have a, we've, we've sidelined a passage on 615, 616 as well. <coughs> I was just going to pick it up. <coughs> towards the bottom of that page, um, where Professor Burrows, as he then was, says, it is submitted that the majority correctly accepted and applied an extended meaning of failure of consideration beyond failure of a promised return, uh, and thereby granted re restitution even though the contract was valid. Justice Kirby dissented on the ground that as the contract here was valid and not been terminated, one could not award restitution. But even if one accepts that there is a general rule that contractual validity excludes restitution, Allowing restitutions on the facts of this case did not conflict with the contractual allocation of risk, which is the justification for the general rule. Uh, as it was put uh, in the majority, joint majority judgment, and this I think is paragraph 21, uh, and the court will recall I uh, also emphasised the last few lines of that to permit recovery of the tax component would not result in confusion between enforcing a contract and claiming a right by reason of events which have occurred in relation to the contract, which in my submission is not the case in our case. So those are uh, the um, academic articles that I was going to take you to. We do refer to one other, I see, in the um, footnotes, but I wasn't going to take you to that. 
Can I next um, take the court to a more recent uh, Australian authority, uh, and that's the Mann and Patterson case. Uh, you will have that at volume two, uh, so where we were, tab um, 18. And embarrassingly, Mr. Rabinovitz, I don't have well, I've a got it in volume three. tab ah. 18. It came uh, late, and that may be why uh, there's some. Um... Just while we're digging it up in the interest of transparency, um, I don't think it matters at all, but just to mention it, I'd, there are two articles by Frederick Wilmot Smith. Um, one replacing risk taking reasoning in LQR and the other contracts and unjust enrichment in the HCA LQR. Right. I'd just well, say you all know I've. Uh, well, my, my led, my, I'd my colleague, I'd say but. if he's on my side, <laughs> he's an extremely talented academic. If he's against me, he's very young and has a lot to learn. Yes, <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> um, my lady, if you don't have a copy, can I? Uh, um, uh, thank you very much. It is in volume three. I knew I had it, but I couldn't find where. Um, right, so, so Mann and Patterson uh, uh, construction. Um, <clears throat> again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this case. It involved a dispute uh, in which uh, the appellants entered into, well, first, I should say, it's a 2019 case, so very recent, uh, and included. Uh, Justice Edelman, formerly of this precinct. Um, <clears throat> uh, the appellant entered into a contract with the respondent for the construction by the respondent of two townhouses on land owned by the appellants. The parties fell into dispute in relation to the works. The respondents claimed that the appellants had repudiated the contract and purported to terminate the contract by accepting that repudiation. The respondent then claimed that it was entitled to recover payment for its work, including variations upon a quantum merit. The claim succeeded. It's a very standard sort of case. You have parties in contractual relationship. Uh, the party A builds something for party B. Um, they are then in dispute. Party A says party B is in breach, terminates the contract, and then wants to claim uh, a quantum merit for the work that they've done. And that's the context in which uh, this discussion arises. And I invite the court to go to paragraph 14 of the judgment, uh, which is page should be on page 629. Uh, and the court will see the heading, Contract and the Subsidiarity of Restitutionary Claims. And again, I, I draw the court's attention to it. it. It reflects what we saw said in some of the uh, English academic articles, in particular one by uh, Professors Beetson and Virgo. Uh, and then immediately uh, below that, we have this, Restitutionary Claims must respect contractual regimes and the allocations of risk made under those regimes. And then there's a reference to Pavey and Paul, uh, which is an important Australian case. Um, and then if I can drop down to uh, the next paragraph, paragraph 15, in Pan Ocean Shipping and Credit Corp, Trident Beauty, Lord Goff uh, spoke to similar effect. As a general rule, the law of restitution has no part to play in the matter. The existence of the agreed regime renders the imposition by the law of a remedy in restitution both unnecessary and inappropriate. Then there's a reference to uh, an Australian case called Lumbers, where Chief Justice Gleeson noted uh, that the contractual arrangements in that case affected a certain allocation of risk. There was no occasion to disturb or interfere with that allocation and every reason to respect it. Uh, Justice Hain, uh, uh, and Gun sorry, Gunner and Hain, Crennan and Kiefel spoke of taking proper account of the contractual rights and obligations that existed and said, as is well apparent from this court's decision in Steele and Taliani, an essential step in considering a claim of quantum merit is to ask whether and how that claim fits with any particular contract the parties have made. Uh, and then at paragraph uh, 18, sorry, 17, the honours uh, noted that it is essential to consider how the claim fits with contracts the parties have made because, as Lord Goff rightly said in the Trident Beauty, serious difficulties arise if the law seeks to expand the law of restitution to redistribute risks for which provision has been made under an applicable contract. And McDonald, Dickens, and Macklin and Costello in the Court of Appeal in England and Wales. Lord Justice Etherton, as he then was with whom Phil and Lord Justice Patton agreed in rejecting a restitution claim, said the general rule should be to uphold contractual arrangements for which parties have defined and allocated and to that extent restricted their mutual obligations. And in so doing, similarly allocated and circumscribed the consequences of non performance. 
that general rule reflects sound legal policy, whereby, which acknowledges the parties' autonomy to configure the legal relations between them and provide certainty and so limits disputes uh, and uh, litigation. Uh, and if I could then uh, uh, invite the court to skip to paragraph 23, where the court, the High Court, turns to Roxburgh. Uh, and this is mainly about saying the present case is different from Roxburgh. Um, uh, cases like the present one, concerned with the enforcement of a claim for remuneration for work performed under a contract upon the termination of the contract for repudiation or breach, stand in marked contrast with cases of restitution such as Roxburgh and Rothman. In that case, payments of money were held to be recoverable because of the failure of the basis on which the payments had been made by the payers. Roxburgh was not concerned with a claim for of remuneration in the contract for work and labour. More importantly, it was not a case of breach of contract on the part of the defendant where the compensatory principle of the law of contract was breached. And in this, the restitutionary claim did not cut across the contractual charter of the party's rights and obligations. Uh, and it's that particular sentence uh, on which we rely. Because that identifies the concern of the law about uh, uh, contract and the subsidiarity of restitution. That's all I was going to say about man. Um, I was going to um, take the court next, if I might, to Barnes. And again, my learned friend did uh, most of the heavy lifting uh, on this. Um, but um, if I can just take the court through it and identify um, passages, um, um, some of them are, I think are the same as my learned friend's passages, just to identify um, propositions of law with which we don't disagree, uh, as well as it's really that about Barnes. Because in our aspect of the submission, um, there is nothing in Barnes with which we take issue at all. So volume one of the authorities can go. And the court will have in mind the facts, and I'm not proposing to go through the facts. Um, it may just be worth drawing the court's attention again. I don't know if they may have done this. If the judgments actually start on page 18, which is a long way in. Um, uh, page paragraph one, I think, down to about paragraph twenty. Um, uh, Lord Tulson, that the, the court is setting out, largely setting out the facts. Um, can, can I just pause at paragraph sixteen, where um, Lord Tulson refers to some of the key provisions affecting the contractual relations between uh, the receiver and uh, the CPS? Uh, the judge made orders in relation to each defendant. Um, uh, they were in materially identical terms. I'll refer to, to them as a single order. And then just dropping down to G, the order gave the receiver a wide range of sta standard powers, including the power to realize so much of the receivership property as is necessary to meet the receiver's remuneration expenses. As to his remuneration expenses, the order provided, the remuneration expenses of a receiver shall be paid out of the receivership property uh, and in accordance with a letter of agreement uh, as exhibited to the witness statement. Alan Brown. So, so one has, in the, in the documents which define the contractual relations, as we'll see, um, uh, a common assumption uh, that uh, there will be receivership property out of which remuneration can be obtained. And that is the basis upon which the contract was made. Now, if you go um, over the paragraph 17, um, you, you saw in paragraph 16 a reference to a letter of agreement. Paragraph 17 is the letter of agreement. Under the heading, um, which identifies the names, we're writing to inquire whether you prepared to act as management to receive it pursuant to section 3 of the uh, POCA. Um, and then this, you will appreciate your appointment is dependent on an order being made by the Crown Court. This letter sets out the terms on which we propose to seek your appointment. Those terms will form part of the order of your appointment. In addition, your appointment is subject to the framework agreement between the CPS and the panel of approved receivers, uh, and then to another um, provision of another set of rules. Uh, and then uh, if you drop, if I can invite you to drop down to paragraph 19, uh, the letter set out the proposed terms of the appointment, including the following terms as to the receiver's remuneration. Your remuneration costs and expenses are to be drawn from the assets of the defendant un under your management, etc. You're reminded that you will have a lien over the defendant's assets for the payments of your fees. The CPS does not undertake to indemnify you in relation to your fees 
in the event that there are insufficient assets within the defendant's estate. The remuneration costs and expenses are to be paid in accordance with the framework agreement referred to above. And then below that paragraph 20, clause 12.5 of the framework agreement provided. In the case of management and enforcement receivers in criminal confiscation cases, the receiver will be remunerated from the sums that they may realize from the sale of assets under which they are appointed, subject to a material exception to the extent that there is any shortfall, the contracting bodies will not agree to grant indemnity. So again, all of this identifies the basis. Uh, and you will recall that um, one of my submissions earlier on was that both in Roxburgh and in Barnes, the basis which it is said has, fa has failed was one which emerges from the contract. And that's no surprise. Can I uh, then invite the court to go to paragraph 98 of um, the judgment? Um, before that, there is a discussion of various other issues which arise, arose, including the um, application of uh, the Human Rights Act and the like. But the paragraph 98, I think on page 40, have uh, the discussion uh, uh, beginning on claims in unjust enrichment. Um, <clears throat> again, um, Lord Tulson begins by identifying uh, the basis upon which uh, this contract is made, that is to say the existence of a lien over the defendant's <coughs> assets for payment of fees. Uh, my learned friend, I think we took you to paragraph 102, and the reference to uh, the passage in Gotham Jones, uh, which um, we've referred to, I think, more than once, which um, um, compares uh, unjust enrichment to torts and contracts and says it's similar to contracts. Um, sorry, similar to torts, thank you. Uh, paragraph 103, an important part of this branch of law is concerned with cases where money is paid or benefits are conferred for a consideration that is failed. Burroughs' restatement accommodates this within the concept of unjust enrichment by stating that the defendant's enrichment is unjust. The claimant has enriched the defendant on the basis of consideration that fails. And dropping down to um, paragraph 105, and my learned friend may have read this to you, to avoid confusion, Goffin Jones suggests, uh, be careful about, well, the, that the expression failure basis is preferable to failure consideration because it accurately identifies the essence of the claim being pursued. Whichever terminology is used, the legal content is the same, the attraction of failure basis is that it is more apt, that failure consideration is more familiar. Failure basis or failure consideration, as it's been generally called, does not necessarily require failure of a promise counterpoint for counterperformance. It may consist of a failure of a state of affairs on which the agreement is premised. And again, we do not um, um, take issue with that, <laughs> or could we? But um, it's no part of our case, um, whatever the, the, the learned judge might have said. Um, that you could only have a failure of basis where uh, that is a, a failure of the promise for consideration. Our case is in identifying the basis. You can't identify a basis which is inconsistent to the promised consideration for a particular payment because that promised consideration will identify the basis upon which that payment is made. And there may be things going on behind the scenes, but it would be subverting or undermining the contract to ignore what the contract says about the basis upon which that payment was made. Uh, and again, Madeleine Friend took you to paragraph 107. Paragraph 109, Madeleine Friend, uh, I think, took you to, <coughs> um, where you get a, a reference to uh, Roxburgh. Uh, which is in the, at that point being cited by Burroughs' restatement for the proposition as to um, the failure basis uh, approach. And then there is um, Lord Tulson goes through the, some of the judgments in um, Roxburgh, as you see. And paragraph 114 is the paragraph to which I referred earlier, uh, and which I ought to just um, draw to your specific attention. In the present case, the receiver agreed to accept the burden of management of the companies on the basis that he would be entitled <coughs> to take his remuneration and expenses from the company's assets and that state of affairs which was fundamental to the agreement has failed to sustain itself. It might nevertheless be argued that there has not been a total failure of consideration because the restraint and receivership order included assets of the defendants other than the assets of the companies. There is a lively academic debate 
whether it is an accurate statement of law today that failure of consideration cannot found a claim in restitution <coughs> or just enrichment unless the failure is total. But that point has not been fully argued and it is unnecessary to decide it in this case. Modern authorities show that the courts are prepared, where it reflects commercial reality, to treat consideration as severable. The Rothman's case itself uh, is an example. Um, and so um, th that is the reason I submitted earlier um, that this certainly doesn't disapprove at least to the extent that it is saying you could have a severable consideration. Just um, going back to, if I may, uh, what he said at paragraph 107. Succinct, a summary, a succinct summary of the meaning of failure of basis was given by Professor Burks in the introduction. Failure of uh, consideration for a payment means that the state of affairs contemplated as the basis of the reason for the payment has failed to materialize, or if it did exist, has failed to sustain itself. <coughs> and then paragraph 109, I think I read this. The, the, the point that a failure of consideration may consist of a failure of a non-promissory event or state of affairs uh, is reiterated in Burroughs. Uh, he states uh, that uh, consideration which fails may have been an event or fair, or fair that was not promised. Uh, and he cites the decision in Roxborough. Now, <coughs> I just want to say uh, this about um, 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 Barnes and, and about our position. As, as, I, as I think I've made clear, we do not say that the only basis that you can look at was the consideration promise. Um, but we do say this. Um, in Barnes, <coughs> the court was considering uh, a premise or a state of affairs that formed the substratum on which that contract proceeded, rather than the basis upon which a particular payment had been made. And since uh, one is looking for the state of affairs on which the whole agreement is premised, <coughs> Although you're not necessarily confined to the agreement, uh, we would submit that it is very unlikely and probably impossible that one could identify a premise or basis for that agreement which conflicts or which is inconsistent with the express language of the contract. In other words, um, wherever one looks and whatever is identified as the basis or premise for the purposes of this analysis cannot be something that contradicts the express language of the contract. And that is so for two reasons. First, if it does, it is unlikely to be the basis or premise on which the contract proceeds. And secondly, to allow such a basis would subvert the general principle of the subsidiarity of claims in restitution to contract. Or put another way, it would involve a claim in unjust enrichment undermining a contractual bargain made by the parties. I'm not sure about the principle of subsidiarity. I wonder whether it's just a different role. A different role. I, I, don't, I, I know you've talked about gap filling and, and the like, but I, that does carry with it notions of subsidiarity. And I'm not sure that's necessarily apt. Well, it, uh, um, with respect, it is orthodoxy. Um, and, and you saw that from the, the Virgo and Beetson mm. approach, which makes it clear. I, 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 you know, I, I'm, not, I don't know, I'm not stuck on particular language to describe it. Uh, but, but what is a clear principle is that uh, the law of unjust enrichment, um, it's gap filling in the sense that it doesn't it is not allowed to contradict I understand that. contracts. And, yeah. and it's in that sense that it's subsidiary. In the same way that tort, in a way, is subsidiary to contracts. You may have a, 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 a potential tort duty of care owed, but if the parties agree uh, a particular um, <coughs> relationship which excludes some incidences of the law of tort, then the court will give effect to the contract. It's the autonomy principle 
uh, which the law respects. Parties can make promises which, in a sense, sideline the law. Uh, and it's also in that sense that uh, unjust enrichment is calculated. Uh, and just to give you an example um, of that, I'm sorry uh, to do this, but the take, um, <coughs> and you could take failure of basis, where it comes into play where the contract can't deal with something because the contract uh, simply does not provide what is or take a, a mistaken payment. Now, where someone makes a payment under a mistake, you don't have a contract which, which uh, says, um, let's assume you don't have a co contract, and party A pays party B thinking it's party C. There's no contract between party A and party B which will determine what's to happen to that money. But it's pretty obvious, if that payment was made by mistake, that party B should not be able to keep that money. Uh, and it's the, it's the absence of any law of obligation which covers that ground, <coughs> which the law of unjust enrichment fills. And it's in that sense that it's gap-filling. But it's not gap-filling in the sense of uh, seniority or uh, a minority or uh, being junior. It is because, uh, you would say, uh, 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 there is no space. There is no space. Precisely that. Uh, uh, gap that, in that sense. Exactly that. Um, so, so that's what I was going to um, say about um, 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 bonds. We do have a, a, have a series of overriding points, and I wonder if I can make them. Uh, they are override, not only overriding, but very much overlapping. Uh, and, and in the end, I suspect they come down to one or two propositions, although I think they have six points. Um, so I do apologize for that. Um, <coughs> um, the points I'm making, I think, are generally found in paragraphs 39 of our skeleton uh, and also paragraph 30. Uh, Sorry, 39 and 30. I should have given you a reverse order. Um, and these are the points. First, we say uh, it is clear that there are several important points of distinction between Barnes and the present case. In particular, and critically, uh, the basis identified in Barnes by reference to which the parties have contracted, namely that the receiver would be able to obtain remuneration from the sale of assets of the company consequent on the Leon was reflected in and not inconsistent with the express terms of the contract. And that, of course, is not the position in the present case. That's a point I've already made. Secondly, again, this may be simply another way of putting the same point, in Barnes, it could not really be in dispute that the agreed basis upon which the contract had proceeded was first that the receiver would be paid for its work, or their work, and secondly, that this payment would be funded by the company's assets. Uh, and it was also beyond dispute that that agreed basis had failed. In the present case, however, if one is focusing on the payment of $950 million, uh, and what was the basis for that being made? Clause 2.4 expressly identifies the basis for this payment, namely the transfer of shares. But um, that is not a basis which has failed at all. The shares were transferred. And so one can only get to the point of contending uh, that the basis for the payment had failed by ignoring or overriding the express terms of the contract. And that's not something that either Barnes nor Roxburgh mandates. Third, since I'm collecting together submissions I've made earlier, I I recognize that, but it may be convenient to do it in this way. Third, and again, uh, this may be a different way of making the same point. In Barnes, although the court did not regard it as limited in identifying the basis or the substratum of, on which the contract was made, for looking at the promised counterperformance, he did nonetheless look at the contract itself in seeking to understand what that basis or substratum was. And the same is true in Roxburgh. 
But the fact that the court recognised that the basis or substratum on which a contract proceeds will not always be reflected in the promised counterperformance does not mean that one can go outside the parameters of the contract or the contractual documentation in search for such a basis or substratum. And even if one can, in certain circumstances, do so, there is certainly nothing in Barnes, or indeed Roxburgh, that would justify a search for a basis or substratum that is expressly contradicted by the terms of the contract. And again, that, of course, is precisely the position in the present case, because here we have a that expressly provides, that expressly identifies the basis for the payment, clause 2.4 as being the transfer of the shares. And just pausing there, it is not our submission that you can only, sorry, that any failure of basis argument necessarily involves you looking at a contract. And that must be right, because you can have a failure of basis argument in circumstances where there isn't a contract. The deposit cases mm. are a good example of that. Chillingworth uh, and um, the, the other cases that, 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 um, that, that the judge goes through. There, the, the, the very problem, the basis which fails is the future contract. So in a case like that, you can't be confined to looking at the contract because there isn't one. But where there is a contract and there is a discussion or argument about the basis on which that contract is made, the points that I'm making in my respective submission hold good. Fourth, <clears throat> and in relation to the general uh, rule that applies in this area, namely that there can be no claim for unjust enrichment, where the payment that is said to enrich the defendant is one that discharges a contractual liability owed to a defendant, as the court will have picked up, uh, it may be worth noting uh, that Barnes, of course, is not uh, an authority for the existence of any such exception. Again, just you know, maybe, maybe make the point clearer. We've said there's a general rule that uh, where you have a contract which calls for a payment, so that the payment is due under the contract, uh, generally a claim for unjust enrichment won't uh, lie. Uh, and the point I'm making is Barnes is not authority for an exception to that. Of course, in Barnes, there hadn't been any payment. It was a quantum merit case in which someone wanted a payment <coughs> in relation to a contract which had been terminated for breach of contract. Where work had Sorry, been I'm being slow. I haven't. Can you just repeat that for me, please? Absolutely. Um, the, the launch position for uh, many of our submissions, and in a sense, the debate which have took place in front of the judge, the judge identifies. The issue that arose at the outset, Mr. Foxon said the rule under which, in the law of unjust enrichment, a payment made under a contract which discharged a debt could not be the subject of an unjust enrichment claim. And Mr. Mr. Foxton um, uh, submitted that was no longer the law. Uh, and uh, we say that it's clear from Gotham Jones and Burroughs that there is a rule which says that if you make a, a payment, uh, and indeed it's law. Lord um, Sumption and Briggs's judgment, you, indeed. You took it yesterday, yesterday. So there is a rule which says if you make a, if a payment is due under a contract, it's not going to be the subject of an unjust enrichment claim because it's discharging something which is due and owing. There is no enrichment. And, there is and somebody in the course of that discussion then said, no, that's but that's what happened in Barnes, so that can't be right. And you're saying no. It's not at all what happened in Barnes. Right. Because Barnes is not a case about a payment being made under a contract which discharges something which is due and owing. There was no payment. Bonds. There had been no payment, and by the time that it came to issue, there was no contract under which payment could be made. Exactly. That was the problem. That was the problem. The problem was, in circumstances where you didn't have a contract because you terminated, work had been done and not paid for, I mean, it was about £500,000 worth of work, including disbursements, how do you deal with that mm. by way of a quantum merit? But it is, it is not a case which can be identified as uh, providing a 
indication of there being an exception to that general rule. The relevance of Barnes is that it is a clear adoption in English law, both of a failure of basis approach and of the fact that you're not confined when you're looking for the basis to the promised consideration. And, and we accept that, but it doesn't go further than that. I ought to say it also appears to think that Roxburgh was correct in the severable consideration. So, so it must not be thought that Barnes is an exception or proves the exception to the rule. Roxburgh might be said to do so, but I've made my submissions with Roxburgh. Uh, it is Australian authority. It is controversial. And to the extent that it hasn't been disfavored by the academics, it has been put on a very narrow basis, uh, which in effect requires that it could only operate in circumstances where it does not conflict with the contract may be said with the contractual allocation of risks, but in my respectful submission, interfering with an express obligation in a contract uh, is a greater sin, if I can put it that way, than interfering with the contractual allocation of risks. It's a more obvious interference and subversion. That was uh, the fourth observation. Fifth. Um, the census comes out of the fourth one. If there is an exception to the rule against restitution where a payment made is one that is due and owing under a contract and discharges a contractual obligation, it is one that is very narrow indeed. Uh, and we would say plainly not available here, where the contractually agreed basis upon which the payment has made has been made has not failed at all. Uh, and where the payment made has indeed discharged an amount owing under that contract. And, and that may be a point which has been overlooked, but it, again, it arises out of what uh, Lord's um, assumption and Briggs said. It discharges an obligation due under the contract. There can be no claim. I think Lord Sumption talked about 150 years of authority or something. My learned friend doesn't explain how one is to deal with that. And that goes back to the rectification point I made earlier. The only way in which um, one gets to a different result is if there were a basis on which you could rectify clause 2.4. The problem about that is that it wasn't a mistake. It's exactly what the parties intended to say there. That's the fifth point. Sixth, <coughs> again, just to put in the point in a slightly different way, it is, we say, clear from the authorities, including Barnes, Roxburgh, and Mann, that the failure of basis rule, at least where it arises in conjunction with a valid and effective contract, is not one that is intended to allow a claimant to subvert a contractual bargain or that would be inconsistent with the subsidiary or gap-filling role played by restitution to contract. And whilst uh, the court, again, this is repeating a point, I'm sorry, but the last time I'll say this, uh, in seeking to identify the basis upon which a payment under contract is made is not confined to looking at the promissory consideration or to a failure of a contractual performance. None of those cases, Roxburgh, Barnes, nothing, mandates an approach uh, where in seeking to identify the basis you can go outside the parameters and find a basis that contradicts uh, the uh, basis identified in the contract. Um, I'll be happy to hear. I'm not going to repeat that anymore. I've finished that part of my submissions. I need to say something shortly about the deposit cases. And the learned friend was right when he said there is no issue of principle between the parties about these cases. And they're the Chillingworth, Cobb, New Line, and Guardian Ocean cases. Um, uh, we deal with these at paragraph 31 of our skeleton. Uh, and these are dealt with by uh, the learned judge uh, between paragraphs 807 and 808. <laughs> and then I think at 8.20 to 8.24. Sorry, at 8.10 to 8.12. Um, and again, I'm not going to take you back to that. The learned judge made uh, this point. Um, um, they're all, as I've already submitted, the deposit cases are good examples of failure of basis. There are cases where payment was made in circumstances where there wasn't a contract. And the point that was made by the learned judge is that what distinguishes is at 
11 and 12, I think. What distinguishes this case from the deposit cases was that unlike those cases, in this case, the payment was made under an existing contract which called for that payment for a particular consideration, which was not the same consideration uh, as uh, the future contract. So the deposit cases don't really assist. They could only assist in circumstances where there was not uh, in a sense, a consideration promised for uh, the payment. My, my learned friends criticize the learned judge. Uh, they say, uh, I think this is a paragraph <coughs> 31 of their skeleton, page 76. They say that the learned judge uh, fell into error uh, in drawing a distinction between the present case and the deposit cases. And the specific criticism they make at paragraph 31.1 uh, is to say, uh, and these are, this is their language, is reasoning once again conflated. One, the issue of consideration in the contractual sense, that's the account of promise, with two, the question of the basis upon which the claimant had transferred the relevant benefits to the defendant. With respect um, to the learned judge, uh, he cannot be criticized at all for the approach that he has taken. He has the criticism about him conflating the issue of consideration in the contractual sense with the question of basis. I mean, he did say, I look at the contract, I find the basis. The basis is identified in clause 2.4, and it happens to be the contractual consideration. So it's the same point that continues to come up between my learned friend and myself. My learned friend says, my case is, look at the contract, look at the contract. His case is, ignore the contract, ignore the contract. Uh, and uh, in my respectful submission, it's always nicer to be able to say, look at the contract, <laughs> in my experience. <laughs> um, but that's really what's between us. <clears throat> um, that's all we have to say about that. Um, I'm just about finished. I, I need to say something shortly about apportionment. Um, uh, and that is this. Um, my learned friend makes the point um, by reference to um, you could make the point by reference to Barnes, um, but also by reference to Guido against Formula One, uh, that there will be cases in which uh, an apportionment uh, can be made under a contract, uh, and that common sense um, can apply. But my beloved friend quite properly acknowledged when looking at Guido, and this is the only case uh, that he cites for this proposition about a common sense approach to is in that even in Guido van der Gaard, uh, the court found its apportionment within the contract itself. It looked at the contractual obligations, it looked at the contractual consideration, uh, and it sought, by having regard to the four corners of the contract, to try and apportion the consideration as between the various obligations. But uh, as, as I think the learned friend acknowledges, he has to go very much further than that. Because not only does he have to go outside of the contract, but he has to go outside of the contract and argue for an apportionment which expressly contradicts what the contract itself says. The contract is clear that the 950 million is paid for the shares. And it's only by ignoring the express terms of the contract and the identification of that for which the $950 million is being paid, that one could ever get into any apportionment problem. And I think the learned friend took you to the relevant authorities. We, we, will also, we also refer to paragraph 363 to 367 of that. I wasn't proposing to take you to that. It's on pages 256 and 257 of Guido. <clears throat> and uh, my ladies, my lords, um, that is um, all I was proposing to say. We say something about the facts in our skeleton argument, but I wasn't proposing to develop those. Because in my respectful submission, even on the facts as my learned friend presents them, he is really not assisted. The only thing I would say is this. So, uh, I was, sorry, yes. No, what, carry what, on, no, carry on. Um, again, my learned friend has, has a general picture, and I understand it, about unfairness. 
he says this is a terribly unfair result. But in my respectful submission, there is nothing unfair in the parties who have deliberately framed their contract in a particular way, for whatever reason, one doesn't know, being held to that contractual bargain. And although my learned friend, perfectly properly, seeks to identify some aspects of the balance and counterbalance of uh, um, um, uh, assets which were going to be transferred and one way or the other, and he chooses the ones that suit him and says, well, these were, you were supposed to transfer these and these didn't. As we make clear in our skeleton, it was a moving feast as to which assets were going to be transferred, as to what the final consideration was going to be, uh, and as to how the parties in the end, if they ever did agree um, on these matters, because they hadn't agreed, as the learned judge found, there hadn't been a, a 2001 SHA with the shareholders agreement. Uh, and indeed, as we identify, when um, a side letter was produced from Linklater's, which purported to set out an agreement under which um, uh, NET and I think Agro Holdings would be transferred, Mr. Guyluk refused to sign that. He said it wasn't what, um, it didn't represent the agreement that he had made. Now again, I, I'm, I'm not taking huge issue with Malone Friend's presentation of the case because he can point to our pleadings and, and what our witnesses say. Um, but it is wrong to think uh, that the position was entirely clear in terms of the balance and counterbalance of what was going to go where in the parties' negotiation in this big divorce, the three-party divorce that was happening. It hadn't reached its conclusion. So, so it, what, what do you say, even if you... I, I, I understand um, completely you say we don't yeah. get there. Yeah. But, um, uh, and on your analysis, even if Mr. Crow's common ground taken as red and at its highest so not only the 200 million but also the breakdown um, uh, you, you say there's still insufficient clarity in the overall context Precisely. of what you see here in terms of certainty of outcome. Precisely, because there was a moving feast it, it was, they, they signed a series of MOUs and then things changed, there were a series of MOUs, they got to MOU 4 uh, which I think was signed but, but was full no, no, so in, none, none of them were okay. signed but, but the, one party said there was agreed. Um, it was unclear that any agreement was reached. And what was perfectly clear with these parties is they continually changed their minds about what they were going to do and how. And again, um, in my respectful submission, that doesn't contradict um, what, what was said. Uh, in the at one stage, or possibly more than one stage, but relevantly at one stage, they decided to enter into one agreement that was legally binding. Legally binding, indeed. That's what they're held to. That's what they're held to. That's your case. That is my case. I won't repeat how the law of unjust enrichment is subsidiary to the law of contract, <laughs> but I'm so tempted to. That's uh, but, but subject to uh, the court. Um, um, ancillary rather than subsidiary. Ancillary. ancillary. Or gap. gap, gap. <laughs> or, it's not intended to subvert contracts. Put it that way. Unless the court has any... No, thank you. No, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Rabindis. Mr. Crow? Thank you. Um, obviously, reply submissions are likely to be a little disjointed. So I'll follow the structure of my man Fred's argument. Um, <laughs> I was just Shaman. going... <laughs> um, I was going to concentrate uh, on the two key cases and some of the sort of fringe commentary on them, Roxburgh uh, and then Barnes. Um, starting just with Roxburgh, the fact that um, there has been some academic commentary on it uh, pointing in one direction or another, in our submission is of no assistance to you um, for uh, any number of reasons. Uh, one is uh, plainly academic commentary is not binding on you, whereas the decisions uh, of precedent value are. Uh, and the second is that, as we have seen, uh, commentators change their minds. Uh, the third reason, if you need a third reason, uh, is that um, commentators quite often um, like the law to be rather neater uh, than it sometimes proves to be. Uh, and uh, when I come to some slightly more detailed submissions on uh, at least some of the commentators, um, I hope to persuade you that it is, in fact, um, the, the, the attempts to 
define why Roxburgh um, uh, was decided as well as it was simply don't work. So um, um, beyond um, uh, that, uh, I just want to concentrate on what the decision does say, and then so subsequently what Barnes um, says about it. So first point then, as I say, is that the, the, the fact that there has been academic commentary um, uh, 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 it, it is not really of any great assistance. The second point specifically is that there has, uh, uh, Melanie Friend made an attempt to adopt um, the suggestion that the explanation for Roxburgh uh, is that the tax element was externally imposed. Uh, in our submission, simply as a matter of analysis, that doesn't actually work as an explanation for the decision. Yes, the liability to pay the tax was externally imposed on the wholesaler. But the contractual issue, sorry, well, the, 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 the civil liability issue arose between the wholesaler and the retailer. That is the area in which there was an apposition between the law of contract and the law of unjust enrichment. The tax law externally imposed did not answer the question as to where liability should fall as between the wholesaler and the retailer. So to draw attention to the fact that the tax was externally imposed doesn't address the actual question, which was the liability as between the wholesaler and the retailer. The contractual answer to that question was that the wholesaler was entitled to hang on to it. And that is why I took you to paragraph 20 of the judgment in Roxburgh. Milan Friend suggested that the paragraph 20 somehow took me by surprise. It doesn't. It says exactly uh, what um, uh, we submitted. And in fact, um, it, it, I won't take you back to it, but paragraph 169 uh, in Kirby's dissent makes the same point. Uh, which is that the contract doesn't produce the result that the retailer can recover, whereas the outcome of the case was that the law of un unjust enrichment does <coughs> entitle the retailer to recover. So Roxburgh is, first of all, not a case which can be explained in terms of its outcome by reference to the fact that the tax was an externally imposed liability. And secondly, most importantly, it is a case in which unjust enrichment produces an outcome which is different from the contractual bargain between the parties. And you would say um, it's also not relevant to this point that the, 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 the part of the contract that dealt with the, the tax, or the license fee as it, they preferred to call it, uh, was not something that was or indeed could be individually negotiated. You say that's neither here nor there as well. Ex exactly so, yes. The, the, the fact that the wholesaler had no ability to um, uh, uh, negotiate the fact that this whole wholesaler had to pay. The tax. He had to pay, and what he had to pay was externally prescribed. Absolutely. Uh, but as between he him, wanted to pass it on to the retailer, and therefore he was going to pass on exactly that to which he was subject himself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the so there wasn't any scope for individual negotiation either way on that, but that's that's a fact, but not you would say a particularly germane fact. It, 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 it's not a germane fact, but but in a sense, it, it, well, specifically, it's not a germane fact because the the issue that then arises is not can the wholesaler lay off the cost of retailer, but what happens when the wholesaler doesn't have to pay the tax, yeah. and that, that that certainly is a matter yes. uh, that is open to um, a, a, a contractual bargaining. They the fact that they didn't subjectively apply their minds to it is neither here nor there because yeah. the contract allocates the risk. And the contract allocated the risk in such a way that the wholesaler was, as a matter of contract, entitled to hang on to the money. Yeah. But and so, so the what what is, I mean, what it leads to is another matter. What one can say about it is that a, it was, a, discrete and, therefore potentially severable part of 
you turn around to pay, and B, because of its external derivation, it was uh, what happened when it turned out that this uh, license fee was a tax and was unconstitutional because it should have been a federal tax, not a state tax, um, and the High Court said so. Um, that was something that came from outside, and therefore if the extent that it was a case of failure of basis in relation to that obligation or that part of the contract, that was something that came from outside. It had something to which with which neither of the parties had anything to do. Yes, that is that is absolutely true. Yes, the failure of basis uh, was, um, was external outside the control of the parties. Right. That is absolutely true. Um, the, the, the only other point um, uh, we would wish to make on it, and my learned friend made much of the fact that the elements of tax um, as part of the price was evident from the invoices, from the, uh, part, you know, the documentation passing between the parties. In our submission, that is an irrelevance. It, it, it is an observation on the evidence in that case. That was the evidence upon which the court accepted that a, um, a, a failure of basis was identifiable in relation to an identifiable element of what was otherwise a single contractual payment. The evidence in our case is not on the face of the contract or in invoices, but the evidence is there. I took you to it at length. And uh, I, I do urge on you the clarity of the pleadings and particularly the answers in cross-examination. Uh, the price for the shares that was in fact agreed was a matter of common ground. And Mr. Uh, uh, Gaiduk, um, uh, in cross-examination, made perfectly clear that he accepted he had been paid the um, uh, specific sums of 15 million in relation to uh, uh, agro-holding and 150 million in relation to any so the fact that the source, the evidential source for identifying the payment, the element of the payment, which was attributable to the basis that failed, happens not to be on the face of our contract, is a purely evidential point. It doesn't make our case different in substance um, uh, uh, from Roxburgh. Malen friend handed up um, uh, a, a, a bit of burrows uh, this morning. Um, we're grateful for that. Just to clarify uh, some uh, exchanges um, that we had yesterday, we absolutely accept that the law of unjust enrichment proceeds by reference to categories. The category we fall into is failure of basis. But the difference between Merlin and Friend and I is that he is trying to nail down failure of basis as being a category that can only be invoked in, in a finite set of factual circumstances. That is why he is emphasizing these arguments about the ex external factors or the face of the contract and that kind of thing. Once you accept that the category is failure of basis, and once you accept, as we will see also uh, when we get on to Barnes, that it is entirely possible to identify the basis for a contract from matters other than the contractual account of promises, our case falls entirely within an orthodox analysis of the category um, uh, uh, which is well recognised uh, for uh, recovering money uh, in unjust enrichment by reference to uh, a failure of basis. Uh, the other thing, um, I, I, and I don't ask you to go back to it, but when you go back, when you when you are looking back at Burroughs, uh, you will see. So there's it's Authorities Volume Two, Tab Fifteen. You will see he very sensibly and deliberately expresses what Milan Friend is calling the general rule. 
in a qualified way. He says, normally, you can't recover. And we accept that. And we'll, we noticed also, Milan Fran took you to Mann and Patterson this morning, and you may have noticed also that was in Authorities Volume um, 3, I think, tab 18. Um, there's a quotation from Lord Justice Atherton, as he was, uh, in paragraph 17 of that judgment, where again the same qualified language is used. The general rule. It's not an inflexible rule. It is a general rule that you cannot recover a benefit conferred pursuant to a contractual obligation. But you plainly can do so in a situation where there has been a failure of basis. Um, Malone Fred also took you to DD Growth um, and a, um, a, a, a one liner uh, in consumption, which appeared to lay down an absolutely inflexible rule that if a payment is made in discharge of a debt, you can never ask for it back in unjust enrichment. Um, again, I don't propose to take you back to that uh, in reply. The judgment at DD Growth um, is in, uh, I think it's tab four uh, of volume one of the authorities. Uh, but we would, while you are um, addressing your minds to this, unless you're giving an extemporary judgment, <laughs> um, uh, if you look at <laughs> um, if you- I'm still uh, thinking about it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> come back at two o'clock. Um, uh, if, if, if while you're looking at DD Grace, uh, we would particularly invite your attention to just four um, uh, 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 paragraphs, paragraphs 58 through to 62, because what is important, I won't read them to you, but if I could just tell you what we submit is the important consideration in that, pay, in, in that case. What had happened, it was one of these cases where there was a, um, a fund which goes bust. Early redeemers get their money back. <laughs> Lucky then. Uh, the liquidator is then sitting on uh, a not very large pot, so in the interests of those who didn't redeem, he ties recovering from the early redeemers. The early redeemers have got their money by redeeming their shares. There is no failure of basis. It is not a case about failure of basis. What is perfectly clear from the way Lord Sumption describes the case is that the redemption of the shares was law legally valid. And the payment that was made by the, albeit insolvent company, the payment in respect of the redemption, discharged the debt that arose pursuant to a valid redemption notice. So it's not a case of a failure of basis at all. And with respect, the same can be said of the climate Benson. We got, a, again, a one-liner from Lord Hope in the climate Benson and Liverpool uh, County Council okay. case. And again, if you take it totally out of context, of course it appears to give superficial support to Madame de Friend's argument. But as you know, the climate Benson case was a, not a case of failure of basis. It was a, the issue in that case was could um, a, 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 a claim be sustained on the basis of, of a mistake of law rather than a mistake of fact, which had until then been the orthodoxy. Uh, Lord Hope was not addressing a case um, uh, uh, by reference to facts involved in the failure of basis. And why, why, it, is that, why is that a material distinction? Uh, the purpose of the statement? Because um, um, it, 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 he, he simply was not addressing his mind to the issue that arises in this case. Nor did any of the other members of the, the, the um, House of Lords say they agreed with him as it happened. It is a one-liner on a point that wasn't argued. So um, uh, uh, we submit that you should not be beguiled by um, passing remarks in cases which are not dealing with um, a, a failure of basis, which appear to lay down a, an inflexible rule when we know that there are exceptions to the general rule that you can't recover in respect of a benefit conferred um, uh, 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 pursuant to a contractual obligation. And that is demonstrated by Roxburgh. Exactly. And it is demonstrated for the purposes of the law of this jurisdiction by um, uh, uh, the Supreme Court's approval of Roxburgh, as we will see in relevant part in, in, in Barnes. Um, 
Could I just um, pause uh, from, from the case law for a moment and just go back to uh, the judgment below? Uh, in, in one sense, it doesn't so much matter, because you will obviously reach your own view as to what the law is. But it, it may just be helpful at this point to um, illustrate to you where and why we say the judge went wrong on this point. Um, you may recall that um, when I was opening, I took you through the judgment. If we just gave it, so it's four bundle tab nine. And um, you may recall, if you look back at page 293, <clears throat> um, we looked at paragraph 777 to 799 where the judge is considering the law on the hypothetical basis that there had been a 2009 shareholders agreement. Mm -hmm. And you recall he, he said all of that is, is, is overtime. He then goes on from paragraph 800 onwards to consider what he regards as the real issue, namely, uh, can unjust enrichment uh, survive in circumstances where there is no 2009 shareholders agreement. And the point in our submission where he goes wrong is that he has forgotten, because he talked about Roxburgh and Barnes in the context of his hypothetical discussion, assuming there had been a 2009 shareholders agreement, he forgets about them and does not mention them in his discussion of the law um, uh, uh, on the assumed basis that there, well, on the, on the actual basis that there is no 2009 shareholders agreement, but that there is a Castle Rose share agreement. And it goes wrong um, if one looks uh, at, at um, if one turns up on page 303. Um, and um, one looks at 818, 819, and 820. And you'll see that he slips from talking about Guido which is the case involving apportionment, to talking about the deposit cases. And we would suggest that the point at which things go um, uh, uh, wrong is really between 819 and 820, uh, particularly in 820, where it says, nor is the difficulty faced the unjust enrichment claims confined to these matters, since the authorities relied upon by Mr. Foxton in support of his submission that there need not be a total failure of consideration if there can be apportionment, are themselves all cases in which there is no con there was no contract in place at the time that the relevant payment was made. And he then goes on to discuss Chillingworth, Cobb and New Line, which are the deposit cases. Now, it is true those cases are cases in which a payment is made in anticipation of a contract being entered into. But he is wrong with respect in saying that um, our argument uh, depends entirely on uh, cases where there was no contract in place. Because he's, he's forgotten, as I say, well, the majority of way of putting it, but inevitably in a long judgment, um, things get occasionally out of place. And this was a very long case and a very long judgment. I intended no discourse from the judge. But he has overlooked his discussion of the relevant authorities uh, when he comes to discuss uh, the um, uh, 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 relevant principles applicable uh, to the availability of unjust uh, enrichment where there is a contract. And um, with that, uh, uh, it may be convenient then just to uh, finish with Barnes itself, uh, which is in the first order of this bundle at uh, tab one. And learned friend, um, very clearly and very fairly, and we would stress inevitably, ex said that he has uh, th that there is nothing in Barnes with which he would take issue. It's good because it's a Supreme Court decision. Um, so if we can in Barnes, then uh, pick it up uh, where we were and look at <coughs> paragraph one o six. Learned friend does not dispute that failure of basis 
or failure of consideration, as it has generally been called, does not necessarily require failure of a promised counter-performance. It may consist of the failure of a state of affairs on which the agreement was premised. Now, in our submission, it is the case that the contract in this case, the Castle Rose contract, was premised on the basis that 750 million was being paid for the shares in IUD, which was ostensibly the subject matter of the global payment. And the premise of the agreement was that 15 million was being paid for agro holdings and 150 million was being paid for NET. And why didn't it say so? Uh, that I can't answer. Although Mr. Gayduck, in his witness statement, paragraph 146, my learned friend tried planting a few poisonous well, thoughts in your mind. Said. By I remember what he said. Yeah. It was clearly deliberate. Um, Mr. Gayduck says in his witness statement, um, because the contract, I think it's paragraph 146, he says because the Castle Rose SPA was produced um, uh, very quickly. At speed. Uh, quickly and simply. At speed. Quickly and simply. Um, uh, 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 the the um, uh, allocation of the consideration isn't explained in it. So uh, th that is the evidence, um, uh, and, and it comes from the other side. Uh, but in a sense, I don't have to answer that, because in our submission, from the pleadings, from the witness statements, and from the cross-examination, it is apparent that it is common ground, that that was indeed the premise uh, on which I mean, one might work. It was how the price was reached. Yes. Um, uh, uh, but it is, in our submission, significant where a party is bringing a claim, as you will recall, the guide of parties were bringing a claim of deceit, and they alleged that the price that was paid for their shares was 750 million. Uh, and in that con in that context, in our submission, wondering why. It doesn't say, say that on the face of the contract. It is entirely natural as a matter of human nature, but irrelevant as a matter of legal analysis because the premise upon which the contract was entered into is a matter of common ground. But the so, premise in the other cases, and I just uh, want to explore what you do say about that, um, it is uh, apparent from the contract itself, yes. whether you're in Barnes or you're in Roxbury. Yes, that is true. I, I entirely accept that as a factual difference. But if one takes, just going back to 106 of Barnes, failure of basis does not necessarily require failure of a promised counter-performance. Now, a promised counter-performance will necessarily be on the face of the contract. So if one takes Lord Toulson's proposition, it must necessarily be the case that the premise upon which a contract is entered into can be ascertained from outside the terms of the contract. And that is reinforced, as I say, by, by what follows. I, I read this to you in opening, so I apologise for going back to it, but it is worth emphasising um, the uh, words in um, paragraph 109 of the judgment. The point that a failure of consideration may consist of the failure of a non-promissory event or state of affairs, is reiter reiterated in Burroughs, who states that consideration of fa which fails may have been an event or state of affairs that was not promised. So again, it is quite clear that the, the premise upon which, the basis upon which a contract is entered into may properly be ascertained from outside the terms of the contractual mutual obligation. And therefore, the basis which fails may be the failure of something which is not itself a contractual counterpromise. And he then goes on to discuss Roxburgh and the um, <coughs> findings uh, uh, in that case. And I won't read all of that, but if one then picks it up at 113, he says, after reviewing the authorities, uh, Justice Gummo held at 101 to 102 that failure of consideration in this area of law may include collapse of a bargain which need not be contractual in nature. 
he held at 104 that there had been no failure in the performance by Rothmans of any promise made by them, but that there had been a failure of consideration in the failure to sustain itself of the state of affairs contemplated as a basis for the payments the appellants seek to recover. Similarly, in the present case. Now, my learned friend uh, very fairly said that <laughs> Roxburgh isn't disapproved uh, in, in Barnes. Lord Tillerson is adopting the approach, is positively adopting the approach taken in Roxburgh. Similarly, in the present case, the receiver agreed to accept the burden of, the man of management of the companies on the basis that he would be entitled to make, take his remuneration and expenses from the company's assets, and that the state of affairs, which was fundamental to the agreement, has failed to sustain itself. It might nevertheless be argued that there has not been a total failure of consideration because the restraint and receivership order included assets of the defendants other than the assets of the companies. There's a lively academic debate whether it's accurate, an accurate statement of the law today that failure of consideration cannot found a claim in restitution or unjust enrichment unless failure is total, whether it's not been argued and unnecessary. Modern authorities show that the courts are prepared where it reflects commercial reality to treat consideration as severable. And the severability of what appears on the face of the contract to be a single contractual sum is the point that's discussed in Guido, Guido Vandergaard. Uh, and um, I, I, I do uh, invite your um, attention to, to, to what is said there, because it is a very thorough review of the current state of the law. And th the outtake from it is that even if a contract does have simply a single contractual payment, the court can, can nevertheless identify that different bases for that global payment can be identified, and different elements of the payment can be apportioned to the bases which fail. In fact, it didn't work on the facts of that case, and neither here nor there. So where one gets to with respect uh, it, 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 from Barn, uh, Roxburgh and then Barnes is that um, the basis which has failed does not have to be a contractual counter-promise. So you can look outside the terms of the contract for the premise or the basis upon which the contract is entered into. The second lead is absolutely clear from Barnes that the fact that a benefit has been conferred pursuant to a contractual obligation does not stop reimbursement even though the recipient of the benefit has not acted in breach of contract. Now, Milano Friends' only answer to that is to make a purely factual point. He says, ah, well, Barnes isn't a case where the receivers paid any money. The benefit they conferred was their services. And with the greatest respect, if one is dealing with, he, he, my own friend said, I think he was fourth. I think what he was saying, there had been no payment to the receivers. I, in well, that case, no I- there payment either, well, there'd been payments by the receivers, obviously all these expenses. I, I, okay, well, um, uh, uh, Lord, I had thought his fourth point this morning uh, was that Barnes is not authority for an exception to the general rule that a payment made uh, under um, a, a contractual obligation cannot generally be recovered uh, by way yes. of unjust enrichment. I, I thought that was his fourth point. If, if he wasn't trying to make that distinction, then I apologise, and I don't have to tilt well, that I'm particular sure. windmill. Uh, but in any event, uh, whether he made the point or not, my proposition to you is that it can make no difference whether the benefit that is conferred pursuant to a contract is the provision of services or a payment. Uh, the, the law of unjust enrichment operates by reference to principle. The principle is either a hard-edged rule that conferring a benefit pursuant to a contractual obligation blocks your entitlement to reclaim it by way of unjust enrichment, or it doesn't. It can't make any difference whether the benefit conferred is the services provided by the receivers in that case, or the payment <coughs> made by my clients in this case. A benefit is conferred under a contract. 
does the fact that it is conferred under a contract block a claim to unjust enrichment? We say no if there's been a failure of the basis in relation to which that element of the payment was made. Um, to what extent is it relevant that in Barnes the court's or discharge of the order in respect to the companies meant that as regards the assets of the companies, there was no contract? There was no contract? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Lord, in the end? That is simply an observation about what the, state of, the, the factual state of affairs was when the court came to decide it. The legal entitlements of the parties um, uh, arise as, at, as a result of the contractual relations which are entered into and as a result of the benefit that is conferred. And at the time the benefit was conferred, um, the, 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 um, the, 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 the contract was, would, was subsisting. So, so that would be our answer to that. The, 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 the fact that a decision is taken by the court after a contract is terminated can't affect the, um, uh, uh, the Well, the contract wasn't applies. terminated. Um, Sorry. In effect, it was terminated. But it was the order having been set aside. It, it was as of then as if it had never been. Um, of but course, I, I agree that at the time that the services were provided and the expense, the professional fees and expenses and so on were incurred, the order, the original order, was in force. Yes, and therefore. basis on which the receivers could claim. Uh, but the... Um, uh, uh, no contractual basis. No basis no, under the order. No. But, but the legal issue that arose and, and the, 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 the element of the decision on which we rely is that the at the time the service is delivered by the receivers, it is being delivered pursuant to a contractual obligation. And so here... At the time the payment is made under the Castle Rose contract, the payment is made pursuant to a contractual obligation. Yeah. The, the, the question whether there remains a contract by the time a trial happens, in our submission is neither here nor there, in relation to the relevant analysis, which is can a claim for unjust enrichment be brought, so to speak, in, in the face of a contractual, the, the performance of a contractual obligation? Learn friends says no, we say yes, but that is an analysis which looks at the state of affairs as at the time when the benefit is conferred, uh, and, and here the benefit is conferred under the Castle Rose uh, 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 contract, uh, and um, uh, at the, in, in Barnes the benefit is conferred at the time where, when the order for the, um, uh, uh, for the receivership is in place. So, the, but the failure of basis occurred later. Yes. Um, but. With yes. Retrospective effect. Yes, indeed. Uh, the, the, the failure of basis did come later. Well, I, I, I mean, inevitably, it comes later in both. But, uh, but in, with in both retrospective situations. effect. Um, could, could I just take a moment there as to whether. Um, so, sorry, I, I, so that, that, is that, that's right, that's with, this, with retrospective effect. Well, I just wanted to check that because I, I, I know the order was set aside in the receivership <laughs> in Barnes. I'm not that's necessarily the sure that the contract of retainer was. Well, I don't say the contract of retainer continued in respect of the individuals. Yes. Um, and that's a point that Lord Toulson makes um, at paragraph 114. Yeah. That setting aside the order uh, as regards the companies meant that with retrospective effect, there was no basis for the receivers to assert a lien or to hold on the, onto the assets. Oh. Well, when you say it, your lordship says that right? with retrospective effect, yes, that is the view the law takes um, as Isn't to the validity of the order. As to the validity of the order, but the question that we are grappling with is what is the interaction between the law of unjust enrichment and the law of contract? And that is a question in our submission which has to be answered at the time the relevant benefit is. Transfer. Well, that can't be right when the, when the failure is subsequent. 
but subsequent but retrospective. The, but the fact that it is subsequent, well, uh, the failure of consideration or failure of basis got is always going to be subsequent to the performance of the obligation. Otherwise, the issue wouldn't, you wouldn't arise. You wouldn't perform otherwise. No, we wouldn't. We, we, so, so, so yeah. that can't be a point of difference between this case and any other. The the the, the, the difference that my lord has identified between Barnes in this case is that in Barnes. The, the form that the failure of basis took was setting aside an order which, in the eyes of the law, means the order was never validly made. And I, I, I accept that. But the, the submission that I'm urging on the court is that the debate between Melander Friend and I in this appeal is whether or not the, exist, the, the, the fact that a benefit is transferred pursuant to a contractual obligation itself provides the answer to the question whether that benefit can be recovered when a subsequent event occurs which destroys the basis upon which the benefit was conferred. Uh, and that the answer to that question in our submission ought to be um, given by reference to the circumstances that exist at the time the benefit is conferred. Because that is the moment of enrichment. But, but not unjust enrichment, because there's been no failure of basis. And uh, there's been Mr. No Rabinovitz failure. talks about uh, the valid and subsisting contract rule. And if in Barnes, the, con the relevant contract is no longer subsisting, uh, I wonder whether that feeds into the analysis as well. Um, I, I could I just have a few moments just to reconsider whether, in fact, th there is a difference between setting aside the order and discharging the contract uh, in yes, Barnes? I, 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 uh, because I, um, uh, the, the two are not necessarily the same. Um, uh, uh, so I, I, I would quite uh, uh, like just that isn't point that, that uh, has, uh, I, I've answered. The other thing I was just going to say, and uh, my lady um, Justice Carr mentioned um, a couple of articles, mm. um, which um, I can't pretend I have uh, looked at. Um, yeah. They're not in the bundles. And if, if we once we look at them, if, if we find anything we would wish to comment on, would it? Would yes, I'm, and I'm sorry, I haven't been very focused in what I've got from either of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm nervous about saying that, but I just wanted to be no, no. transparent about it. No, well, I'm, I'm, I'm um, very grateful, and, and I'm sorry we didn't pick them up. No, no, and I'm sure that, there are many um, articles that none of us. <laughs> Look what I see. Uh, indeed, indeed. Um, but if, if, if we could just have, have, have 48 hours or so to, to scan those and, and let you know if uh, we have wish to say anything. Um, I think it would be very helpful if you both uh, had a look at those and if there is anything you want to say about them, that you put that in writing uh, and that you do so uh, um, by 4 pm on Friday. Thank you. Um, could I just Turn my back and, and, briefly, just... and that you do so preferably on no more than one <laughs> side of the <laughs> um, right, right. Yes. Two at the most. <laughs> absolutely. No, no, absolutely. No. We, will, we will be, I hope, as, as, as moderate in our submissions on that as we have been in the presentation of the case generally on both sides. Can I just um, discuss <laughs> that point about um, the, the difference between, possible difference between the contract and the. Please do so, Mr. Crane. In, in, uh, in Barnes. I'm, I'm grateful. Um, uh, 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 if one looks back at paragraph 98 uh, in Bar sorry in Barnes, so page 40, the terms on which the CPS asked the receiver to agree to act were set out in the letter to which I've referred. The relevant provisions are set out paragraphs 19 and 20. The letter included the statement that the receiver would blah blah blah. There's nothing we can see in the judgment to suggest that that letter agreement was somehow rescinded or set aside. Indeed, the order of appointment was um, set aside. Well, uh, that that certainly, um, but the uh, the letter <coughs> made it clear, uh, did it not? And we're looking at. Paragraph 16 and 
17 and so on, which you showed us, um, made it clear that the receiver was to take his remuneration and expenses from the assets yes. Oh, yes. in the receivership yes. under the receiver's lien. Yes. I mean, 19, the letter says, you are reminded that you will have a lien over the defendant's yes. assets. And the CPS does not intend to that. No? Yeah. Well, having such a lien depends on the order and on the validity of the order. Um, it's only the order that can give the lien. It, 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 it is only, uh, yes, it is only assets in the, in, in the hands of the uh, receiver, validly in the hands of the receiver, that can make the lien of any value. I agree, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the contract, as a contract, is rescinded yeah, and, because and the receivership order is discharged. No, but the lien is discharged. Uh, well, the opportunity to exercise the lien is discharged. The lien exists, as, uh, as I Does would it? understand it. A, a lien exists insofar as assets are lawfully in your hands in the discharge of a function. Um, if the order is discharged, then the opportunity to exercise that lien has gone. Well, but that doesn't mean that the contract under which the right to claim the lien is, dist is, is itself rescinded. But well, the, contract, a... the contract says, we're not going to pay you. Correct. You're going to be paid by virtue of your lien over the assets in yes. the receivership. Now, yes. the entire receivership was not discharged because there were individuals but whether they had any useful assets is another matter. It was discharged in respect of the companies, uh, and it was, of course, in relation to the business of the companies that the largest volume of the expenses and time yes. had been incurred. So there, the receivers had a lien, but to all intents and purposes, no assets over which they would be able to exercise it. I, I, I accept that, but as I say, I'm, and that's a the, failure of basis. Um, the, the the failure of basis uh, is that um, yes, in the event that there were no assets over which the lien could 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 be um, yeah. uh, exercised, I, I entirely agree. With yes, I accept that. Um, and why Barnes matters for our case is that that supervening event did not involve any breach of contract by the CPS, but the law of unjust enrichment produced a result under which the CPS had to make a payment which as a matter of contract they did not have to make. So in that very clear sense, the outcome in Barnes does involve the law of unjust enrichment producing an outcome which, to use Melania Friend's language, cuts across the allocation of risk under the contract. And the provisions, for example, of the framework agreement, etc., which are set out in, in the uh, quoted passage in paragraph 17, continued. We don't know what that framework agreement was, but it will be general terms yes. between the CPS and receivers in these circumstances. Yeah. Um, final uh, point, um, uh, just uh, Milan Friend ended on the facts um, very sensibly from his perspective, not going to them in any great detail uh, because they are not of great assistance to him. His point generally was that this was a, that the, 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 the discussions involved a moving feast. With the greatest respect, if one goes back to the material I took you through, particular points upon which this claim, this part of the claim is based, were not moving feasts. The allocation of the consideration to NET and agro holdings was not a moving feast. The evidence is clear on that. Subsequent events involved all sorts of discussions about how to implement that. If one goes through the later paragraphs of the judgment into the 900s and the 1000s, you can see the subsequent events. And there undoubtedly was an amount of movement in relation to how to implement 
the bargain that had been agreed. But there was no moving feast in relation to, and this is one reason why we have been very surgical in choosing which bit of the judgment to appeal, because these two assets, NET and Agro Holding, do carry the clear evidential agreement between the parties as to the consideration that was allocated to them. Unless there are any questions from the bench, those are our submissions in reply. Uh, no, thank you very much, Mr. Crow, and thank you to you to you both for your very helpful and eloquent submissions. Thank you too to everyone else behind, um, and also uh, the teams uh, who are at the other end of the live stream, uh, because I think that everybody would have put in an enormous amount to make this hearing as uh, uh, streamlined and uh, helpful to us as it has been. So thank you. Um, uh, 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 despite uh, Mr. Cray's encouragement, um, we have decided that we will reserve judgment. Um, it's one of the easier decisions that we have to make. Um, and uh, so therefore, as you will be so well aware, in the usual way, uh, a draft will be circulated. We'd be grateful if you would pick up uh, typographical errors only. Uh, despite the huge temptation to do otherwise um, uh, and in the usual way if it's possible for you to agree an order we'd be grateful if you would and uh, short uh, written submissions if you can't none of that comes as any surprise to anyone uh, thank you very much indeed um, uh, this has been a pleasure Thanks,